for this uh, November 15th day. Welcome to our Rotary Club of Ames as we begin our second century of service. And as always, I would ask that you would stand as we say our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And um, as we take a moment to uh, uh, memorialize some people that um, are hurting or we have lost, we have uh, Rod Place and uh, services have been set for Rod who we lost this last week as a member of the club. Uh, there's, let's see, let me get my notes. Visitation will be Friday at Bethesda Lutheran Church on uh, the 19th. And then the services for the uh, funeral will be Saturday morning at 1030. And Grandin Funeral Home is taking care of the funeral arrangements. And Karen had sent out a note, if you want to go ahead, obviously, to, to share anything with his wife, Ingrid, and family, please uh, do so. Also, um, I'm helping today because Kelsey, uh, and we'll keep her in our thoughts and prayers, but more so uh, her daughter, Ellie, who, 18-month-old, broke her arm yesterday. <laughs> so uh, Ellie's having a cast put on today. So... Uh, those are the two I have of note. Uh, does anyone else have any other announcement that they would like to share concerning um, any fellow Rotarians or family members? I'm not seeing anything, so let's go ahead and take a moment, please. Thank you. We have a couple of announcements, but one, we want to welcome some new members from the ISU Foundation. They are corporate members, and we have Mary Evanson and Rosa Unal. So thank you, ladies. I don't know if you're on board with us today, but we'll look forward to your participation in the future, and uh, just excited to have you with us. And with that, uh, Louie, I'll hand over the mic, so to speak to your care. Okay, <clears throat> and a welcome to all you watching on Zoom, and join me if you like. Welcome to you from Ames Rotary, Nevada, London, or Gay Paris, from far off lands or the USA. We're glad that you are here today. Come back again whenever you're near. Join us and then we'll make it clear around the world you will always be welcome at Rotary. Thank you, Louie, much appreciate that. We have a couple of announcements and Glenn, I'll let you go ahead and take, if you will, the so-called microphone to uh, introduce what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow is our seventh annual partners meeting where we get all our partners uh, together this year again by Zoom. We did that last year and it worked real well. We'll do it again this year. Uh, so far, we have uh, 35 or 36 people uh, just from our district alone signed up. And it looks to be a pretty good day. Uh, we'll talk, we'll have. Uh, Heliard talk again. You saw his report a couple of weeks ago. And uh, President Andrew Zawadi will be also talking via Zoom. Uh, he had, Both of them are pre-recorded on Zoom, so we're trying to eliminate some of the international problems with those sort of things. And another uh, <clears throat> part of this is we're talking about what has happened and what we will be doing or want to be doing in, in the future here. So anybody's interested, please contact Mary or, and uh, she'll make sure that you get a link to the meeting. And one more thing is uh, Allison Walters has been putting together some uh, Facebook uh, notices for our, our group. 
and thank all our partners in the past and hopefully some in the, we'll get more in the future, but what we need from everybody in the club is to go to the uh, Ames Rotary uh, Facebook page and like and share all of those so they get spread out as far as we can get them spread out. Uh, that would be a great help to us. Uh, I can't even begin to express how big a help that is to you start using social media more and, and get more people involved around the country, around the world. Anyway, thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow at the meeting. Yep. So again, that's tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock our time. And uh, please join uh, the Global Grants Committee as they make this wonderful presentation. We also have the wreaths coming in for the, uh, the sales that we had conducted earlier. Um, they'll be delivered this weekend. I'm not going to have to read the, the uh, slide here to you. You can do that yourself. But I think the key is, if you would be available to also assist, please let Karen know so she can help set up a delivery schedule. And Karen, please put me on that schedule. Um, I'd be more than happy to help deliver in that regards. And those are the announcements I have. Does anyone else have a, a quick word or something that they should share or would like to share that I uh, may have missed? Well, with that, I have the great opportunity to introduce our program for today. We have Miss Rebecca Runyon with Bessie's. And she grew up on a dairy farm in Iowa where she learned that flexibility is essential to happiness and where she began to love ice cream. Uh, Rebecca, I could have loved to learn uh, love ice cream anywhere, I think. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> so during college, she learned to make ice cream and make plans to launch an ice cream parlor with a storefront in Ames. But this thing called COVID-19 and the pandemic changed the plans. So right now, we're going to hold, uh, she's holding Bessie's socials ice cream socials to raise funds for social justice initiatives. And with that, it is my pleasure to enter. And by the way, the one thing we're missing is all free ice cream today. <laughs> You'll have Rebecca, to come please. to the social. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kent. I will now share my screen so you can see my slides. Super. So I'm someone who enjoys hearing a good story. Maybe it's the inner child within me. Um, and I've also heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. So today I'm going to share nine different um, pictures with you from my own entrepreneurial journey, as well as um, just nine different lessons or stories that have happened during my journey as an entrepreneur um, in the ice cream space so far. Oh, my slide. There it's going. So my first lesson was that you don't have to be old to be an entrepreneur. And I think that when I think back to where my entrepreneurial journey began, it was really before I even knew what the word entrepreneur meant. I grew up on my family's dairy farm in Clinton, Iowa, and we had Holsteins. And so um, the stereotypical black and white dairy cows, if you will. And when I was going to the county fair each year, I would see these cute little brown cows that they were called jerseys. And I thought, oh, those ones are cute. When I get old enough to be in 4-H in show at the county fair, I think I'd like to add some of those to my family's herd. And so come fourth grade, um, it was becoming Christmas time and I knew I wanted to be in 4-H and I knew I wanted some of these little brown cows for the fair. So when I was talking to Santa, I asked him for a cute little Jersey calf. Well, luckily, um, my dad must have had a word with Santa and being the practical farmer that he is, um, decided that it would be a better bet to and bus better business investment truly um, to have me receive two pregnant cows. And so I did indeed receive these jerseys and they both then gave birth to calves that spring that I ended up showing at the county fair. And if you're unfamiliar with 4-H, it's a youth organization that is just so helpful in teaching kids life skills that um, will serve them well for the rest of their lives. And so even as a little 
fourth grader, I was, you know, going to the county fair, not just showing the animal, but all along keeping financial records of how much is it costing for bedding and feed and um, vet bills, all of those things. And how much will I make down the road when I'm selling the milk for that these um, cows will down the road produce. And so for me, I was learning business lessons without even realizing it. Um, I was also going to different um, interviews. So part of the Bucket Bottle Cow 4-H project is that you have a 30-minute interview with a judge and they ask you questions um, about your the care that you provided for the calf. And I just remember that one of my um, earliest business lessons per se was in the feedback I received from my very first interview. And they wrote, you didn't shake the judge's hand. Well, I was nine years old. Nobody had told me that I was to shake um, somebody's hand, but um, that certainly, that was a lesson that stuck with me and um, continues to be part of my business advocate going forward. Um, so as a fourth grader through my senior year of high school, I was heavily involved in 4-H and um, really learned about the finances of a business, not just in the dairy industry, but in some of the other um, project areas that I was a part of. So fast forward to now my senior year of high school, I'm deciding where I'll be headed for college. And I decided um, to come to Iowa State University. And I'm pretty sure I changed my major like 10 different times. Um, I was very indecisive as I had so many different interests coming in. And what I found to be fortunate was actually, even though your major does give you so many technical skills that are important as you um, go into your career, your major doesn't necessarily have to define you. So even though I landed upon the major of agricultural studies with a minor in entrepreneurship, and then went on for my master's in agricultural education, it turns out that I was having so many experiences during my college journey that were outside of my major coursework that were really helping to shape my entrepreneurial um, journey and career. And so I remember waking up one day my freshman year, I was in my dorm in Larch Hall and I had a dream that was to open an ag education center and um, ice cream shop on my family's dairy farm. And I had a million ideas for what that would look like. Um, fortunately, I was involved with the Agricultural Entrepreneurship Initiative. And under Kevin Kemley's wise words, he said, you know, I think your idea for this is actually a mile wide and an inch deep. And you need to flip that. You need to have an idea that's an inch wide and a mile deep. So have more um, depth to your idea than breadth starting out. He's like, sure, you can have all these um, ideas down the road, but for a starting place, start with something small. And so I did um, participate in a variety of um, pitch competitions and um, different learning opportunities at Iowa State that helped me um, toward that idea of an ice cream shop and ag education center on my family's farm. However, um, it was during my fall of my junior year where I basically had gotten to a point where all of the planning and um, like pre-work to um, launch this venture was at a place that my next step was to truly go back to the family farm and open it if I was going to do this. And um, with, you know, a few years left of my education and um, really falling in love with the Ames community, I decided, you know, I think I'm going to put this ice cream idea on a back burner, um, but I was really hooked on the idea of entrepreneurship by that point. At that stage, I had already added the minor, and so some of my courses uh, were helping me to develop big ideas, and so it was really exciting to me. I think that entrepreneurship is a bug that you can get bitten with, and then um, it's hard to really cure that without um, continuing on and starting something, and so um, I fall of my junior year, I was looking at, okay, so I want to do something entrepreneurial. What can it be? Maybe at a smaller scale than the whole ice cream venture starting off. And I actually made a pivot into a different industry and started off with a social goods sock company. So from fall of 2017 through February of 2020, I was running a social goods sock company. So it's called Lunch Socks and I was selling wool socks to provide meals for kids in need, both globally and locally. And the lesson I learned there was it's okay to start small. When I initially started the sock company, I thought, okay, putting a pause on ice cream, 
What's something that I can essentially run out of my college apartment um, that's not going to take up a lot of space that a lot of people buy on a repetitive basis? And I landed up on wool socks. And so I started off very small and by that point had learned the idea of a minimum viable product or what's the smallest, least capital intensive thing you can, uh, and time intensive thing that you can test your market with. And so for me, it was buying 10 pairs of socks off of amazon.com. I posted them on my personal Facebook page. I said, comment on the socks that you want and they're yours, I'll ship them off. You can send me some cash in the mail. And within the first hour, those socks sold out, sold out. And at first I was like, okay, these are all my family and friends that are buying this product. I'm not really sold that this is a good idea until I'm going to have strangers who are buying it. So I started restocking and the power of social media, people were sharing the post. And suddenly I found myself in a bit of a cash collecting frenzy and was like, mm, maybe it's not the best that people are mailing me checks onto my apartment. I mean, I appreciated the income, but uh, maybe not the most reliable or organized way to run a venture. So um, by the end of that November, 2017, I had transitioned to having a website where I sold those wool socks. And um, over the course of the next few years, just really grew that business. And it was a um, great starting place for me because by that point I had seen how business could really be used as an agent of positive social change in the world. Um, because thinking back to where I was a 4 h -er, I was in it for the cute calf, not for the money. Um, but then when I came to college and learned more about um, business and entrepreneurship, I saw what a tool it could be for doing good in the world. And so over the course of those next two and a half years running Lunch Sucks, um, I learned a lot about business and really got involved in the space of social entrepreneurship. And come February, 2020, I was able to sell that company to a new owner. She's continuing on with the socks. Um, the exciting part for me is that my dream of having a sustainably local source supply chain came to life. So she's actually a sheep farmer here in Iowa. And so she raises the sheep, has their wool turned into these lunch socks that are still fighting um, childhood hunger. So um, when I started that out of my apartment, I didn't really have an exit strategy in mind, contrary to what my entrepreneurship professors were telling me. Um, I just thought, you know, we'll try it. We'll see what happens. And it did pan out to be successful. And so I think that um, my lesson there was it's okay to start small because something big could turn um, and come out of it. And so um, while I was running Lunch Socks, I um, was also still mulling around the idea of the ice cream business. And so I was a part of the honors program while at Iowa State University. And as part of the honors program, over the course of your four years, you're taking a variety of classes that um, have a little bit more academic rigor, but allows you to bring a more creative um, approach to your education. And at the end of the honors program experience, students are expected to either, um, they're completing a capstone of some sort, either a research project or a creative component. And I chose the route of the creative component. And that's a pretty open-ended capstone project that could be either related to your major or not. Um, and I decided to publish a children's book that focused on educating kids about agricultural entrepreneurship. And so even though I was just doing this as um, you know, my honors project and had fun going to schools and reading to um, kids about the, the story that was semi-autobiographical um, in nature, I was realizing this is actually kind of a marketing tool for me because um, even though my goal had been, let's talk to these kids about ag entrepreneurship, there's um, discussion questions in the back of the book that um, address like if you were to start a business when you grow up what would it be and I was really focused on educating these kids I was realizing that okay people are hearing about this ice cream they're excited about it still um, maybe this isn't just a crazy dream that I have and by that point I was further along in my college career as well and so um, I tried all sorts of creative marketing things with both of 
the companies. Um, as I think about the socks, I was at the state fair selling socks on a stick one of the days um, of the state fair. I also um, may or may not have been spotted on central campus at Iowa State wearing a cow costume for um, a pitch competition that I was in pitching Bessie's Parlor, the ice cream business. Um, but I've just found that like something from all of the different things that entrepreneurs do on a daily basis that the creative marketing side is really what um, gets me most excited. Um, so I've worked in outside of my own companies. I've done a couple of um, marketing roles for two other Ames-based startups and have just been able to learn so much and try out so, um, so many different exciting ways to share the product or service. So um, when I realized, you know, as I'm sharing this children's book that I published um, with people around Iowa, I was realizing, okay, people are pr pretty excited about the ice cream. And so for me, um, I went forward and decided to partner up with a, another Iowa State student that I knew through the Ag Entrepreneurship Initiative. Her name's Natalie Ike, and she's the founder of Hightail Creamery. And so her goal was more on the like food production side. I was more interested in the education side um, of the industry. And so she had the plan of, I'm going to open a creamery in my hometown um, in Northern Iowa, and I'm going to be producing ice cream. And she now has like other um, agricultural products there, but she um, was a lot of fun to work with. And going back to the idea of like, it's okay to start small, um, similar to the 10 pairs of socks off of Amazon, I wanted to take a safe kind of first step into um, the ice cream world. And so for me, that first step was saying, hey, Natalie, can I um, make some ice cream in your shop. I'm going to do pre-orders so that I don't, um, you know, have to make this huge investment of making all of these pints of ice cream for people if nobody's going to want them. And so for um, Christmas 20 or Christmas 2019, I did kind of a test run with these ice cream pints. And um, it was with the intention that summer 2020, I would have my own shop in Ames. Um, and it was a lot of fun that um, I learned quite a few things during my time working with Natalie to make the ice cream, um, learned about the art of making ice cream even more so. Um, but more, most importantly, the concept that your network determines your net worth. And um, I don't think that that's just in terms of financial, but also regardless of what your measure of success is or your worth, um, having people who are, you know, smarter than you and who are talented in other areas, having them as part of your network really does um, determine how your um, success is going to come to be. And so I'm really grateful for connections like Natalie um, and the people who I met during that process. So um, 2019, people pre-ordered pints, picked them up um, from a location here in Ames, and then um, fast forward, 2020 came, and that was a crazy year, I'm sure, for everyone. So for me, I think the key lesson, as if I hadn't already learned it growing up on a dairy farm, was the idea of be flexible. So 2020 came, and I had gone from having a successful pre-order experience with the pint, Christmas pint sales in 2019, and was intending to open an ice cream shop in Ames 2020. Well, when Iowa State closed down for um, spring break and then students never came back um, that semester due to COVID, it was the end of ISU spring break. I was sitting um, at Ada Hayden with my um, boyfriend at the time and he proposed. And so that was the first um, like plan, um, unplanned thing of my year that got thrown my way even before COVID. So the week before things like the world kind of shut down with COVID, I um, had been proposed to, said yes. Um, so knew, okay, this is going to be changing my life and business dynamic a bit um, in a good way, of course, but it was changed nonetheless. And then, you know, fast forward a week and I still, um, the world was, you know, turned kind of on its side with COVID and not knowing um, what the future would hold. And of course, it would have been right around that time that if I were to be having a storefront, um, I would need to be signing a lease on a 
um, building and getting all of the equipment. Well, when all the um, restaurants and businesses are closed um, due to COVID and state order that, you know, you can't do dine-in, um, I was, you know, thinking maybe we'll put a little pause on this and again, revisit it in the future, see how this storm um, really turns out. And, you know, I'm very, in retrospect, fortunate for COVID and that it did um, put a pause and kind of redirect the direction of my company, because for me, it, it really did pan out like exactly how it was supposed to in retrospect. In the moment, it was a little um, disheartening and confusing. Uh, but then as I fast forwarded, um, seeing come December 2020, I did the pints again with Natalie. Instead of having people pick up at a central location in Ames, I did delivery to doorsteps so, um, so as to be COVID friendly. And that just you know was one of the many ways that I um, strive to be flexible during 2020. So also during 2020, I was scrolling through Facebook one day and saw a job posting from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at Iowa State. And I read the job description, not looking for a job by any means. I was running this, going to be running this ice cream shop. And I read the job description and I was like, wow, how if I were to ever have a quote unquote real job someday, I think that this would be the job for me. And so I said, you know, I'll apply. What do I have to lose? It's good to go through an interview process every once in a while and keep uh, my resume polished up. And so I applied. Um, and then come the beginning of 2021, they did indeed hire me. So um, again, being flexible, didn't necessarily know um, what that would mean for Bessie's Parlor and the ice cream with taking the Iowa State job. Um, and just to tell you a little about that role, um, I'm directing the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Academy for College of Liberal Arts and Science students. And so um, it's students from all sorts of different majors, which I find funny considering I changed my major so many times as a student. And it's helping out those students who really push the status quo and who want to start something. And so um, whether that is a business like myself or um, some more community focused civic innovation, um, there's a spot for every LAS liberal arts and sciences student to start something as a part of this two year academy. And so during the first year students come, they work on skill development. And then the second year they'll get paired up with an industry specific mentor. So as a shout out plug for that, um, if anyone's interested in being a mentor for the Academy, I'd be more than happy to chat after. Um, but anyhow, with what that looked like starting off with the ice cream and in January of 21, having this new role at Iowa State, um, I told myself I'm giving myself the first quarter of 21 to just get my bearings with the Iowa State role, um, give that my full attention and see what um, what would happen with Bessie's parlor. Um, and it's fortunate for me because the Iowa State role is a part-time position. So um, it's designed that not only am I the director of the program, but also um, part of my title is entrepreneur in residence. So by design, um, they want the person in this position to be continuing on with their own entrepreneurial ventures so that they can um, stay polished for the um, different skills that they're teaching the students. So um, as I got my bearings with the Iowa State role and began to think, okay, so what does this look like for Bessie's Parlor? I was realizing that for me, what was still so important with the ice cream going way back to my freshman year dorm room, it really was that education piece. And, you know, it had gone from being ag education at first um, to over the course of time, like maybe it could be like a hands-on learning opportunity to teach like about entrepreneurship through ice cream. And so um, over time, the, the common thing that stuck with the ice cream was education. And in the Iowa State role, I was realizing, okay, I every day get to come um, and work with a group of students who are trying to start something. And that really, for me, satisfies my desire to be an educator in that regard. And so then for the business, for the ice cream, what that leaves is ice cream. And while I do love ice cream of all different flavors, um, the making of the ice cream was never um, what got me super excited. I didn't mind it, but that wasn't um, really where my passion was lying. And so I was like, okay, how can we keep 
these customers who are happy um, and wanting ice cream per the creative marketing um, aspects um, and with the um, children's book, I was like, okay, I still have these um, customers who probably want ice cream. I don't care that much about the ice cream, but I do care about education of people. What I landed upon was doing Bessie socials. And so what a Bessie social is, is an event that um, provides ice cream to the Ames community um, and people can make a free will donation. They can, if they think, oh, this social justice initiative that Bessie socials is pairing up for this quarter isn't of interest to me, come eat the ice cream, don't give any money. If you're really um, having a heart for that organization, you can say, hey, I'm going to, you know, put $50 in the box um, and enjoy my ice cream. So we had our first quarterly social um, in August of this year, and it was to benefit the Ames Romero House. And so the Romero House is um, located in downtown Ames, and a friend of mine from Iowa State actually started it. So Matt Mitchell decided that he didn't want to just um, go and get a typical job after college. He decided that he really wanted to live in solidarity with um, the poor in our community. And he saw a huge need for people who are um, either transitioning back into society from incarceration or who were just struggling with homelessness for whatever reason. And so I was very um, excited and pleased with what Matt was working on and decided what better place um, than the Romero House for the first social to benefit. So in August, we set up um, in the Romero House's backyard. We had about 90 people come and get ice cream, um, raised over $1,200 for, for the Romero House. And as far as the ice cream and paying for ingredients in that, I do sell a variety of merchandise, the books, um, some stickers, shirts um, through my website. Right now, if you go, it'll say that stuff is out of stock, but later this afternoon, I'm getting a restock. So if you're interested, tune back into that later today. Um, but I realized that this was a really good balance for me to be um, able to do something that I really did care about that being education with the Iowa State job and something else that personally I just have um, such a desire to um, help in the world of social justice. And so each quarter um, we have a different social. So our next one will be December 13th. We'll have some Christmas flavors and it will be benefiting Martha's House of Hope, the crisis pregnancy home here in Ames. Um, I've got more details about that in a coming slide, but um, something that was um, just a funny side intermission story as I um, tell you more about the socials is that in August, like the week before the social, um, the first Bessie social, I learned um, the lesson of why it is so important to answer your phone. And I do answer my phone typically, um, but when I get you know a call from some unknown, um, looks like a scam number, I typically just let it go to voicemail. And I'm like, if they wanna talk to me, they'll leave me a message and I can get back to them. <laughs> and so um, I had received a couple calls from this New York number and I'm like, I don't know anybody in New York. Why are they trying to get a hold of me? And I wasn't seeing any voicemails come through. So just ignored it. Um, I was with my husband one night and had a call come through and he watched me ignore the call. And I'm like, well, I don't know who it is. I don't have time to take this call. And so he had seen that happen. Well, then fortunately the next day, um, we were at a gas station in my hometown. I ran in to get something. He's waiting in the car um, and I left my phone in the car with him. And the phone rings again. It's that unknown New York number. And my husband answers it. He's a realtor. So he knows you've got to take the phone call or you're not going to get the client. And so he answers my phone and they're like, yeah, we're calling for Rebecca. And he's like, what is this about? They're like, oh, we're a producer with Good Morning America. And we were just wanting um, to chat with her about featuring um, her ice cream business on our show. And I'm like, well, I was in the gas station. I come back to the car. My husband mutes the call and he says to me, he's like, that number, it's good morning, America. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I get on the call with them and I'm telling them um, about the upcoming social. And basically they were doing a feature 
for all 50 states, um, how each one was, each state's businesses were really like rebounding or how they were coping and coming back from COVID. And I guess that um, my 2020 experience was a story that they wanted to um, feature on national television. And I believe that's how Karen probably heard about um, Bessie's parlor in general. Um, but I, I think my lesson there just as a funny ha ha was answer your phone because you don't know what's going to be on the other end of that call. And um, I think that in a bigger way, um, it's almost an analogy of just like having a yes mentality of when um, someone reaches out with an opportunity, say yes, you don't know what it might become. And it kind of goes to the idea of your net worth determines your net, your network determines your net worth. Um, but getting back to the gist of Bessie's socials, um, I think a really important thing for me was being a part of your community. And so um, when I had that first social, I had no idea how many people to plan for. And I was just really thankful that we didn't run out of ice cream. It would have been a good problem to have, I suppose. But um, it was just wonderful to see the community supporting. And again, um, I think that for me, what was powerful was it wasn't just my friends and family that were showing up, but the larger community and even strangers. And so um, as I go forward with Bessie Socials, my goal really is to um, focus on the local AIMS community. And so each quarter having a different social justice initiative um, to be benefiting from the ice cream socials that we hold for Bessie's. And then lastly, my... Um, this goes with what I'm doing with the Bessie socials as well as my role at Iowa State, but um, it's the idea of don't bushel basket. So that's um, kind of a little term that I've coined um, going back to the Bible story about don't put your light under a bushel basket. And so something that I encourage my students to do is that regardless of what type of venture there's or um, activity they're starting um, through the academy, I want them to go and just share um, and give back because I don't think like I wouldn't have had all of the opportunities I did at Iowa State if it weren't for alumni and other people who, you know, had gone through similar things as me, um, learning about entrepreneurship and then passing that along to me. And so um, in all I do, I just strive to not bushel basket, but to share um, about my experiences. So thank you for um, letting me share about, about my experiences today. Um, my last slide is just information about the um, next social. So it'll be benefiting Martha's House of Health, like I said, um, because they strive to keep their location um, confidential for the safety of the women who are um, staying there. It will be held in St. Cecilia Church in their narthex. That's just the front um, room that you walk into as you go through the main doors. That will be Monday, December 13th from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, basically come enjoy ice cream. You can give a free will donation if you wish that will benefit Martha's House of Hope. Um, and then there will be a very brief um, program that just someone from Martha's House of Hope will share about their mission. So um, without further ado, here is my contact info and um, website. Feel free to follow along on Facebook or Instagram. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about my entrepreneurial journey or Bessie's parlor as a whole. Uh, Bessie, would you, uh, Rebecca, uh, how should I refer to you? You can refer to me as Rebecca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bessie Thank you. is actually one of my 4-H um, calves names. So it was named after one of them. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, sure, just slightly a little bit about this upcoming event with the uh, uh, Martha's House of Hope. What What is their primary purpose? What are they doing? Yeah, so Martha's House of Hope is um, designed to serve women who are experiencing a crisis pregnancy. So whether that was um, unexpected or they had a hardship happening um, in their life at the time of their pregnancy. And so they provide housing and resources, um, both material as well as relational um, to those women in need. Okay, I thank, I thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Absolutely, great so question. So we had a comment from a, uh, a Mr. Jeff Johnson. You might know of him. He yes, says he I remembers do. being among the first live customers. He still has three pairs of your socks. I love it. Um, <laughs> yes. So hello, Jeff. I'm glad you're on for today. But um, yes, I 
in addition to having the online store with the SAC company, I also then did um, do a variety of events. I was in a couple of storefronts, including the Iowa State University bookstore. Um, and it was, I think that that was a place that I really did learn about about the power of a network was with um, events through the Iowa State Foundation because I was meeting so many successful entrepreneurs and alumni um, who were willing to support me and buy my socks. And so um, I just remember on the day I graduated um, for my undergraduate degree, um, seeing Jeff in the hallway before commencement and he was wearing my socks. So um, definitely a special memory of that. Um, I have another comment. Um, so what if someone wants to buy your ice cream for a private party? Could we buy your ice cream? So um, I get that question a lot. And because like I said, the making of the ice cream isn't necessarily the fun or exciting part for me. Um, I do de currently decline those um, opportunities. I is one a time constraint, but also in the um, Coming months, I would like to partner up with the new local ice cream shop on Main Street. I haven't um, been able to have a conversation with them yet, but um, there is a local ice cream shop coming to Ames Marmalade Sky, um, and it would be an ideal situation for me to be able to um, purchase the ice cream for them, support a local business, um, and take that off my plate so that I can just focus on the marketing of the socials. But great question. Um, and I would also, um, put a plug if you're looking for ice cream for a private party. Um, Iowa State does have a creamery now. And so over in the food science building on the east side of campus, they have um, a lot of exciting Iowa State themed flavors. And so I know that they do um, catering for events. Now. Um, talk about your graphics. Who's responsible for those? Um, that would be me. I love um, the graphic design side of things, which is kind of funny. I was a College of Ag grad, um, but I think that you know entrepreneurs wear a million different hats and then figure out which ones they want to keep wearing and which ones they want to hire out. And for me, um, continuing to wear the graphic design hat is something that um, I found to be fun and rewarding. What happened to your business uh, after your exposure with Good Good Morning America? Yeah, so I had a lot, quite a few people reach out um, to do like presentations like this. Um, I also had support in my shop, so I had you know orders for stickers or um, books, things like that, um, all around the country. So it was definitely um, a positive thing. I think that for me, um, the biggest thing was more local awareness. So. Um, it's funny, like I had been, you know, doing this for a while, but then, um, you know, not all of Ames had, of course, heard about it. And so um, getting the word out even locally, I think that's probably the biggest benefit and um, most important thing for me, because the more um, local people that can come to the socials, the bigger um, that impact in the world of social justice will be. Someone says, can you give us the title of your book? Is it sold at Dog Eared Books downtown? So the title of the book is The Best Ice Cream That Ever Was Licked. And um, so long title, don't know that I'd name it that again. Um, and it is not for sale at Dog Eared Books right now. I did have a conversation with Ellen and Amanda, the owners there, um, a couple of weeks ago. I told them that I'd actually like to do some revamping to the book because it was... Um, it was 2018, I think, that I wrote um, the book. And obviously, um, some things have changed in my own autobiography since then um, and goals with the business. So um, Dog Yard Books is definitely on my radar. And I think that I would want to do a little bit of revamping to the story before um, bringing it to the local audience again. But it is available um, on Amazon and through my website, BessiesParlor.com. Yeah. What's the price for it? Um, it is $8.99. And then if you've got Amazon Prime with the free shipping, then free shipping. So even better. I think that was there another comment there, I think. Oh, do you still have the your dairy oh, cows? Dairy cows. Um, so in 2016, my dad had both of his knees replaced. And so with that, he was out of commission for quite a while. And during that time, basically it was 
our dairy farm was set up in a Thai stall um, fashion. So those familiar with the dairy industry, it's not the ones where the cows feet and udder are at eye level. It's the ones that you have to squat down to actually put the um, milker onto the cow. And so squatting is not exactly what a knee <laughs> surgery um, patient has um, on the docket. And so in 2016, my family sold the majority of the dairy herd to another um, farm in Brooklyn, Iowa, and now transitioned to having a beef herd. And so it's a lot less labor intensive for him, far less squatting, of course. Um, and so at that time, um, some of my dairy cows were sold, some were retained as part of the herd and then bred back to an Angus bull. And so to get more of those beef genetics um, as we grew the herd. And so I still have now, they're not, not as many are dairy cows, many more are beef, but around 20 head um, that are at my family's farm. So my dad and I have kind of an owner operator agreement where, you know, he came to visit me in Ames this weekend. I haven't been home and seen the cows in a month or so, but um, he showed up with the feed bill and had to write that check. And um, it's a good relationship and keeps me in my ag roots and using my degree to some extent. Any more comments, questions, observations? All right. Well, I'd be happy to send just links to some of the things that I um, mentioned during the presentation today so that you're able to um, stay connected with Bessie's Parlor and myself. But thank you so much for having me today. Well, Rebecca, obviously we appreciate it. And also we will be doing a, uh, we uh, put this onto a YouTube so that members that were not able to join us today will also be able to view in. And I know for a fact, I'm going to forward this to a couple of people at the 4-H Foundation because they'd be thrilled to hear about your story. Fantastic. That sounds great. Thanks. Well, as we close with this, I do have a quote. You can't buy happiness, but you can buy ice cream. And that is pretty much the same thing. Yes. And Rebecca, with your uh, business line and your uh, decision and commitment to making society better, I can't think of a better example for us than somebody who exemplifies Rotary. So we want to, you to be a, our next member of Rotary. So think about that, young lady. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. With that, let's go ahead and do the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. And I'll wait just a moment for... Uh, Karen, put the slide up. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And with that, we'll adjourn for the day. Thank you all for being a part of today's uh, uh, session and meeting. Appreciate your involvement. Thank you. Take care.